So plasma membrane, the cell membrane in particular, uh, lipids, primarily phospholipids, we're going to have uh, some proteins embedded in the membrane, and then also carbohydrates that are actually going to be associated with phospholipids and proteins along the surface. So the lipids that are present, one of the chemical characteristics of a lipid, what makes it a lipid, is it doesn't really interact well with water. And in fact, lipids are hydrophobic. And if you take a lipid like oil, whether it's cooking oil or motor oil, and you pour it into water, you form the two layers. Okay? And there, right there, you can see in that little thought experiment, you can see why lipids uh, are good um, molecules for producing lipid bilayers. We're trying to separate two watery compartments. We're trying to separate the intracellular fluid that contains a lot of water and the extracellular fluid that contains a, water, a, a lot of water. So lipids that are going to form a layer between those two fluid layers are going to be real beneficial. Okay. So lipids actually are going to go a step for, uh, step further when we find them in the membrane, and they're actually not going to be totally hydrophobic. They're actually going to be what we call amphiphilic. And what that means is. They both love water and they hate water. Or portions of the lipid are hydrophobic and portions of the lipid are hydrophilic. The head of the lipid is going to be hydrophilic. And the way that we model a lipid as biologists is we draw structures that look something like this. This is the head, and it's going to be hydrophilic. So this is where we're going to find our water. Okay? So this might be the extracellular fluid. And then down here in the intracellular fluid, we're also going to have water here. The tails, which are here, are going to be hydrophobic. Okay, so hydrophilic heads, hydrophobic tails. So these tails are hydrophobic, meaning they don't like to interact with water. So if I have water down here, I want to protect these hydrophilic tails. And so if we add in another layer of lipids where I have the tails all interacting together, I can protect the hydrophobic tails tails by embedding them in the middle of the membrane. And now we've created our lipid bilayer. Here's one layer of lipids, and here's our second layer of lipids, oriented in such a way that the tails are away from the water, and the heads that like to interact with the water are facing out into the water. This is a little bit more detail on um, what the lipids actually look like. So this is the biology shorthand, and this is how we might draw a membrane. I take it even a step further. Whenever I draw a membrane, I just put up two lines to represent the bilayer. So I take, I'm, I'm even lazier than, than this example here. So here in green is the head, which is hydrophobic, and purple is the tails. And then we can take a look here at a uh, dot diagram and a, or a bubble diagram and a... Uh, an actual um, chemical formula, we can take a look at the chemical composition. I'm not really as concerned about these two here because this is not a chemistry class, but just recognizing in purple hydrophobic and in green there the head hydrophobic. Now, in addition to the lipids and the phospholipids, that look like this, that have this particular chemical structure. We also are going to have cholesterol that is present in some concentrations inside of the membrane. And cholesterol, when it's embedded in the membrane, is going to add stiffness to the lipid bilayer. And what that stiffness is related to is the stabilization of the phospholipids. Because you see, the 
lipid bilayer, we're going to need a very unique uh, state of matter for our lipid bilayer. And what I mean by that is we want a lipid bilayer that's not so loose that it just breaks apart and not so stiff that it loses its physiological function. We basically want a lipid bilayer that is in between being too loose and being too stiff. So if we can add in cholesterol, which you can see in this figure here, we can actually maintain certain amount of distance between individual or groups of lipid molecules. So let me maybe draw this just a little bit differently. So draw up another membrane here. And I'm not going to put any cholesterol in here. Okay, so there's another lipid bilayer. No cholesterol. You can see that the distance between the lipids here is drastically different than the, the, diff the distance between the lipids there. The closer that lipids get together, just like all matter, the closer that we get to a solid. So this is going to be far more solid. Okay? And the reason that is is because as we transition from gas to liquid to solid, it all is dependent on how fast and how much movement the molecules, individual molecules have. So a gas is going to have the highest amount of molecular movement. Liquids, like the water that you have in your bottles, is going to have a little bit less molecular movement. And then a solid basically has very little molecular movement at all. This would be very, very solid. Analogous here is going to be something like butter or lard, especially lard, which if you put out on, or bacon fat, you put it out on the table at room temperature, it's very solid. And it actually is not a very conducive cell membrane. But then I start to add in some cholesterol. And now we've separated out the lipid bilayers. We've added a little more distance. And by adding a little bit more distance, we now have a little more room to move. So we go from very little room to move here, which is more like a solid, to adding a little bit more distance between my individual lipid molecules. And now I actually have a little bit more movement. So now in this figure here with the embedded cholesterol, we're moving closer and closer to being more like an oil. Now, we don't want to go completely to a, a, a liquid here. We want it still to kind of be sort of solid, sort of liquid at the same time. So we want to maintain these cholesterol molecules at a specific concentration that actually is going to relate to the temperature, the environmental temperature. Uh, in addition to adding cholesterol, the... Phospholipids, they can come with a saturation or a non-saturated, unsaturated versus saturated form. And when they're unsaturated, there's actually going to be a kink that forms in one of the legs. And by having that kink present, now the, the next lipid in line here can't be as close. You can see that if I had another lipid over here, this distance is a lot closer than this distance here. And this kink prevents that really tight packing. So by preventing that really, really tight packing, we're keeping the, the bilayer closer to being an oil rather than a solid. Is this making sense to everybody? We add in some cholesterol, and this also does some of the same, uh, some of the same work to, to maintain uh, the structure more like an oil rather than a solid. Now, I don't want to get too loose, right? I don't want to have huge distances. If these are two neighboring lipids, I don't want to have huge distances between them because then we become way too loose. The fluidity is way too high, and the cell has very little integrity. So to prevent this from happening, which, by the way, how could I cause this to happen, to cause the lipid molecules to be further apart? What's that? Um, no, nope, not too much cholesterol. Think about water becoming vapor. You put a pot of water on the stove, and you add heat to it. And as that heat is added to the water, the molecules of water begin to move faster and faster, and they become a gas. And the distance between the water molecules increases. So if I increase temperature, say, 
tomorrow it's 90 degrees instead of 32 degrees. I've just added temperature, and the lipids in all reality should move apart because of that extra heat and the change in temperature that's occurred, right? So I want to prevent that as well. It's 32 degrees today, very well tomorrow. It could be a lot warmer. I guess I don't even really know if it's supposed to be or not, but we've had days this winter where it's been 32 degrees during the day, and then the next day it's almost 70 degrees, and that's drastic 40-degree change. So how do we actually accommodate that? Or how do we accommodate even larger changes, say a caribou walking around on the frozen tundra ground in the Arctic, who goes from 100 degree days, 90 to 100 degree days, to days that are minus 120 degrees Fahrenheit, has almost 220 degrees of temperature change throughout its year. Well, the pads that we find in the feet of caribou are actually going to change the amount of cholesterol that is present inside of the lipid bilayer to help accommodate for those drastic changes in pressure, to maintain a fluidity of the membrane that's basically the same throughout the, throughout the whole year. Now, in addition to allowing the, the cholesterol molecule to separate individual lipids apart, it's also going to hold those lipids at a certain distance apart. So it holds them apart, but it doesn't let those lipids go too far away. So you see the consequence there that the lipid is going to now be maintained at a certain distance within the optimal fluidity for the cell membrane. So as temperature increases, the molecules are going to want to move further apart because of the additional heat, but the cholesterol is going to prevent them from moving further apart. Does this make some sense? So in the lipid bilayer, we're also going to find cholesterol. And that cholesterol is going to vary in concentration. And as it varies in concentration, we're going to see changes in fluidity. So we either prevent the phospholipids from packing too tightly together, or we're keeping the phospholipids close enough that they don't separate far enough away. Now, in all reality, the cell membrane, we basically want to have our fluidity the same 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, right? We don't want to have the fluidity of our membrane become really oil-like and then become very water-like. We want it to be right in the middle and we want it to basically maintain the level of fluidity. That would be a homeostatic variable that we're trying to regulate there for cell membrane fluidity. And so we can alter the composition of the cell membrane with cholesterol. We can increase cholesterol when it becomes too cold outside to prevent the molecules from packing together real tight. And we can remove some of it when it becomes warmer. And we maintain, if we can measure fluidity of the membrane, we maintain the membrane's overall fluidity. So cholesterol is going to be important in maintaining that fluidity and preventing the membrane from becoming too liquid or too solid. Now I've already mentioned that there are carbohydrates that are associated to uh, the cell membrane and that we find on the surface of the cell membrane. And they are going to be attached uh, to proteins and to lipids. When they're attached to a lipid, the carbohydrate and the lipid collectively are known as a glycolipid. When they're attached to a protein, we can call those glycoproteins. Now, these glycolipids and glycoproteins, they form what's called the glycocalyx. And I do have an image here that I'd like to share. So here you can see examples of glycoproteins uh, and, and some glycolipids, uh, carbohydrates associated with those different molecules making up what we call the glycocalyx. Now, the glycocalyx appears under microscopy as a fuzzy coat. So the surface of the external surface of the cell membrane appears very fuzzy if you have a high enough resolution uh, uh, microscope. So we're talking something more along the lines of uh, like an electron microscope, not, not just a compound light microscope. So it appears to be very fuzzy, and this is associated with those carbohydrates that are present. 
And this glycocalyx is actually going to become really important. And it becomes important for a variety of different reasons. One of the reasons is it acts as a cell fingerprint. Okay, a cell fingerprint, or it's a way for the cell identity to be maintained. So we have cell identity markers. And you're actually familiar with some of these cell identity markers. I can ask any of you in here what's your blood type, and you probably know. Your blood type is actually going to be associated with certain carbohydrates that are present in the glycocalyx that we can find on the red blood cells. In other words, the makeup or the composition of the carbohydrates on your cells is unique to you. And I can't necessarily just give my blood to you without some sort of adverse reaction unless you have the same carbohydrates that are present. Because what will happen is your body will see the blood that I'm giving you if you don't have my blood type as invading cells and will destroy them because they're not supposed to be there. So we have to go through and we have to type match. So I'm A negative. If you have an A negative blood type, I can give you some of my blood. Yes? Why not just have all the same? Because it's the spice of life. No. <laughs> <laughs> They're genetically defined. <coughs> and um, <coughs> if we all had the same blood type, we'd have a higher probability of all being wiped out. What if we all had the same glycocalyx and it was just the human glycocalyx? This is the human fingerprint and our bacteria became really good at disguising itself as a human cell and we all got that and it was all so it could be very very dangerous for the human for, for any population if you had that kind of genetic similarity now the glycocalyx is also going to be involved in protection of the membrane so it's going to help structurally and, uh, and protectively um, to keep the membrane at a high level of integrity. What I just alluded to there just a second ago with the bacteria is what we would call immunity. Uh, our glycocalyx, basically your cells are unique, are unique to you and really you want to keep your own cells. You don't want to have transplanted organs and you don't want to have blood transfusions. You really don't. Because you run into a lot of problems with immunity. Um, so if they don't match, you know, if I needed a liver transplant or something like that, and they weren't, they, they didn't go through the process of matching all of my glycocalyx characteristics with the donor liver, and they just popped it in, I'd reject the liver right away. And I wouldn't just be a waste. Right? Um, and the reason that is is because my body would be like, holy cow, look at all these cells that aren't supposed to be here in my immune system and immediately start to attack those cells to destroy them. The glycocalyx is also going to help out in a process known as cell adhesion. And cell adhesion is just simply the way in which cells stay, stick together or adhere together. So if I have a liver uh, made up of a variety of different cells, I want those cells to kind of stick together to remain as a liver. I don't want them just to basically disperse and fall apart. So we actually physically adhere them together. And the glycocalyx is going to help out in that process. Okay, we've mentioned that lipids have proteins that are embedded in the membrane. I'm going to call those membrane bound proteins. So membrane bound proteins. Now, a classic definition of a cell membrane is it is a lipid, a selectively permeable lipid bilayer. And you probably have all heard those terms before. And selectively permeable is just simply one of the functions <coughs> 
of a membrane. And there are other functions as well, cell adhesion, uh, transport, molecule transport, cell recognition. These are all examples of cell membrane function. And that function is all conferred by these membrane-bound proteins. So we're going to have proteins that are embedded inside of the membrane, like you can see here in, uh, in red and in yellow. These are proteins that are bound up. Each of these proteins does something very specific. It might be a specific chemical reaction that they catalyze. It might be a specific molecule that can be transported through some of one of those proteins. It might be uh, proteins that help in that cell adhesion process. So there's a variety of different things these membrane column proteins can do. So I'm just simply going to state that these membrane bound proteins can provide functions. And I want to just sort of go through a variety of these functions that actually can occur. So what I'm showing here in this figure is just a variety of different ways in which these proteins, which are chains of amino acids, can interact with our phospholipid bilayer. And you can see that there's a variety of different forms or structures or way that the proteins look, and it's going to lead to a variety of different reactions and interactions that these proteins are going to be involved in. So here you have a couple proteins that may be involved in transmitting signals into the cell across the cell membrane. Here, this is a pore. And so this may actually be an opening through the, the mem membrane or maintain an opening through the membrane to allow stuff to cross through the membrane. This may be an enzyme that catalyzes some sort of reaction up close to the membrane. So these membrane pro uh, bomb proteins are going to have different shapes and they're going to provide different types of functions. I'm just going to go through and give you a few of the most common functions that we're going to run into. So there are going to be membrane bound proteins that can act as receptors. Receptors are going to be proteins that are going to bind to what we call a ligand. Now a ligand is going to be simply just something that can bind to a receptor protein. Now whenever we bind a protein with something, we cause that protein to undergo a conformational shift. So we switch the, um, the structure of the protein and that causes the protein to do something. And in the case of a receptor, it will cause that protein to signal something to happen. So a signal to cause something to happen, or uh, we may potentiate a signal. So maybe it's insulin binding to the insulin receptor and causes that signal to be produced where we have a protein called glucose transporter 4 that goes up to the cell membrane, exposes uh, extracellular domain out into the extracellular fluid around the cell, and picks up glucose and then causes that glucose to be picked up into the cell, thereby reducing blood glucose levels. So we'll have proteins that are receptors. We're also going to have some proteins that are enzymes. And we've already dealt with enzymes, so you should know that these catalyze reactions. So these are going to catalyze reactions. And really, they're going to help produce metabolites, and they're going to help regulate the chemical activity inside of the cell. We are also going to have some proteins that act as channels. And channels are going to allow <coughs> passage of various molecules. So sometimes we're going to need molecules inside of the cell, sometimes we're going to need to get rid of molecules. These are going to come through the actions of channels. So here you can see a model of the cell membrane with a couple different types of channels that are going to be present. And there are a variety of different types of channels that are going to be present that are important in maintaining the function and the 
actions of the membrane and of the cell. Some of our channels are going to be non-gated. Okay, and what does that mean? Well, it means there's no barrier. It's always going to be open. So if it's always open, a non-gated channel simply forms a passageway or a pore through the membrane. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that anything just, just anything can cross. A lot of times, it's still going to be very specific, and so it might be a sodium channel that just allows sodium to enter into the cell. But it's non-gated, and so it's always going to be open. We also have a series of channels that are going to be gated. And a gated channel is going to require a stimuli to open. So it's just like this door behind me here. I need to twist the, the, the handle in order to open it up. And then we can go through this barrier of the wall. We can't go through the wall right now because the gate's not open. Same thing happens here. As long as that gate is on open or closed, nothing can cross. We require some sort of stimuli to open. And we have a whole bunch of different types of gated ion channels that are normally closed. And then when that specific ion is required, maybe inside of the cell or to be dumped out of the cell, we'll have a gated channel that will open up. Now this term gate, basically kind of think about this as being something that needs some sort of key or stimuli to open. So what are the keys? What are the things that can stimulate the opening of a gated channel? There are three main ways or stimuli for gated channels to be open. The first one is going to be a ligand gated channel. So ligand gated, we've already talked a little bit about ligands. So a ligand or something needs to bind to act as the key to open this particular gate. So in skeletal muscle, which we'll talk about later this semester, in order for that muscle to be signaled to contract, we actually have to release acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter which will act as a ligand for the, uh, the acetylcholine receptor to cause the acetylcholine receptor to open up. And when it opens up, it allows sodium to rush into the muscle cell. We can also have gated channels that are stimulated to open due to a change in the electrical nature of the cell. These are going to be called voltage gated. So voltage, which is a characteristic of electricity, charged particles moving from one point to another, that change in voltage is going to be the key to open up a voltage gated channel. And we'll see voltage-gated channels as we work our way through things like nervous system physiology and even skeletal muscle physiology later this semester. The last type of gating that occurs at, uh, in some frequency inside of human cells are going to be mechanically gated cell uh, channels. And this is going to require physical movement. to open the gate. So uh, in the aorta, which leaves the heart, we have some specialized cells that are called the carotid bodies, or that are uh, actually really um, the, the aortic bodies. And changes in blood pressure are picked up by those aortic bodies. And we have a signal that gets sent into the nervous system. And this helps to regulate our blood pressure. So pressure increases in the blood. It will mechanically disrupt the channels inside of the aortic body cells to generate the signal, to, to stimulate or potentiate a signal. And we're going to talk about that during A and P2, but just kind of give you a little introduction there. So we have proteins that act as receptors, enzymes, channels. We are also going to have proteins that act in cell adhesion. 
chemical receptors that act in cell adhesion, and this is just simply going to be binding individual cells together. And I have an example of cell adhesion here. You can see uh, that we have two plasma membrane or two cell membranes here and proteins that interact from either side or either cell uh, to help to adhere these and keep these two different cells closer together. Now the next group of, or the next protein function I want to talk about uh, for membrane-bound proteins is actually more of a system of proteins. It's not just specifically a channel or an enzyme. It's going to be taking a lot of these different uh, elements that we've already talked about and putting them into more of a pathway or more of a full system. We are frequently going to run into signaling systems inside of the cell. There is a lot of information that gets relayed around the cell to help regulate when certain physiological things happen. The most common signaling system that we run into is known as a second messenger system. And we are actually going to talk quite a bit more about second messenger systems and actually signaling systems in general in uh, other organ systems. But it's a good time just to sort of introduce you to this concept because most of you probably don't really have a great understanding if you've ever been exposed to messenger, messenger systems uh, to begin with. So I'm just going to introduce, and I'm actually going to highlight just a single second messenger system uh, and talk a little bit more detail about that. So we have a variety of different signaling systems. This is how information is handled inside of the cell and we usually result in some sort of cell change or metabolic change or physiological change. How many of you have ever heard of a cyclic AMP second messenger system? Okay, so just a couple of you. This is going to be the specific system I'm actually going to detail. And what you're going to see in this figure, there's a lot of stuff going on here, but what you're going to see is you're going to see things like receptors. And you're going to see that those receptors are actually going to bind to a hormone or a ligand. So it would be a ligand-gated receptor. And then we have something happen that initiates a protein that acts as an enzyme, ASE. You can see that it's an ASE, so we know that it's a, uh, an enzyme. And ultimately, it's going to run all the way down where we have some sort of response that occurs in this particular cell. So this is sort of taking all of these proteins that exist in the membrane and associated with the cell and actually result in something physiologically important. So second messenger system, I'm going to highlight the cyclic AMP system. Again, these are signaling systems. These are ways in which information can be relayed around the cell to result in a physiological response. I'm going to start with what we call the first messenger, which is right here in this figure. Uh, you can see that specifically it's, it's a hormone. It doesn't necessarily have to be a hormone. We're just using sort of an endocrine example here. That first messenger is going to be a ligand. Again, a ligand is just something that can bind to a receptor. Now, the thing that's going to be unique about the ligand in a signaling system is it cannot cross the membrane. Frequently, these are going to be things that are hydrophilic, and they won't have, it's not energetically conducive to cross through that hydrophobic region in the middle of the membrane. So rather than expending a whole lot of energy to make that happen, we just simply interact with a receptor that has an extracellular side and an intercellular face to cause some stuff to happen inside of the cell. So that ligand can't cross the membrane, so it interacts with a membrane-bound protein that acts as a receptor. So that receptor binds our first messenger. That first messenger uh, receptor, or I should say our receptor, is going to be 
transmembrane, meaning extracellular phase and an intercellular phase. Since it is stationary in the membrane, we are going to have to use some other mechanism to move the signal around. And so we actually have what's called a relay protein. Uh, in this case, it's a G protein. And that G protein that acts as a relay protein is going to be peripheral. And when I say use the term peripheral, I'm talking that it sets on the periphery of the membrane. It's not totally bound up inside of the membrane or trapped in the membrane like this receptor is. This is actually going to be quite a bit more mobile. So it's a peripheral membrane that's just a or peripheral protein associated with the membrane but not bound up inside of the membrane. Now, this peripheral membrane, it's going to do something which means we need energy and we're going to gain that energy, NRG, from GTP. Why GTP? Well, basically, it's just like ATP except for we swapped out that nucleotide. And we've already talked a little bit about that. So just think of this as being a triphosphate. We're, we're going to break that bond between the second and third phosphate groups and liberate energy and it's going to allow usable work to be performed. So what exactly is the usable work? Well, the usable work is we're going to interact with this other membrane-bound protein called adenylate cyclase. You already know what this protein is because it's ASE, so it's an enzyme. What exactly does it do? Well, this enzyme is going to catalyze a very specific reaction where we take ATP and we remove the second and third phosphate groups. So we end up with now AMP. We no longer have triphosphate, we just have one, so we call it mon monophosphate. Whenever ATP is converted into monophosphate, AMP automatically cyclizes or turns into a circular molecule. So we call it cyclic AMP. So cyclic adenosine monophosphate, which is going to act as a second messenger. So the first messenger initiated the signal to begin with. The second messenger, cyclic AMP, is going to perpetuate that signal. It's going to set, it's going to continue the signal. <coughs> now that second messenger of cyclic AMP actually has a really good ability to activate other proteins. And in fact, it's going to activate a series of proteins that are kinases. And that's what you can see happening here. The cyclic AMP activates protein kinase. Uh, in its inactive form to its active protein kinase form. So it's a kinase. What do we know about this molecule? Okay, so we have ASE, so it's an enzyme. What about kinase? What do kinases do? Remember this, don't we? Okay, it's going to add a phosphate. So kinase is always phosphorylate. Whenever we phosphorylate a protein, we either activate it or we deactivate it. Now, if we activate or deactivate a protein by adding a phosphate onto that protein, we're changing the physiology occurring inside of the cell. So then at the end of this second messenger system, and this is typically what we uh, do or how we summarize the result of uh, any messenger system inside of the cell, is we say that we have some sort of response. And we can call it a cellular response, we can call it a metabolic response, we can call it a physiological response or a physiological effect. physiological response. 
So physiological responses occur, and that means we have something physiological that's just happening. Okay, so, 